<laughs> Great, thank you. Since uh, you know, this is a gathering of colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, what I thought I would um, do is uh, give you the broader framework uh, within which I'm working on this current book. Um, there are many parts of it that are uh, still scattered. Uh, I went to India having thought about uh, these issues, uh, particularly about uh, how neoliberalism was changing the relationship between generations. I had thought a lot about it. Uh, I had also been going to India every year or every other year. But I must say that having lived there for 10 months, I came back thinking I don't have a book. <laughs> what I have are uh, a lot of uh, these notes. Um, so I'm still working through how to, to write uh, several of the chapters, but I do have a framework, and I thought that's what I will share with you. I have an anchor. Uh, I have a theory uh, about what's going on. So um, after me, the flood, the phrase uh, comes from um, a writing, uh, a letter by Marx. Uh, where Marx uh, tries to understand why is it that we keep, why is it that capitalism continues to survive? What is it, what is it that makes us continue to uh, follow through with a system which actually has very little regard for the future? And he says, at the core of uh, it is this belief after me, the flood, that this flood will hit someone else. The problems will fall upon someone else, and I'll be OK. Uh, and I'm very interested in that phrase uh, in, on, uh, in India. Uh, while I was there in the last 10 months, I heard many, many versions of it. You can only live for now. Uh, you know, Forget about tomorrow. Let me just enjoy things as they are. Um, and I think there is something to that uh, about, uh, which can tell us about the experience of uh, capitalism. And I'm using the term here, neoliberalism, uh, to speak of um, um, a radical version of capitalism, which uh, started to come about in the world uh, since the 1980s, uh, but in, or 70s, one could say. Uh, but India formally adopted uh, neoliberalism as a doctrine in 1991. Its elements are basically it believes in the free market uh, as the correct system. Um, the Indian government started to divest itself from the public sector, so started to privatize things like education, health, medicines, building of roads. Uh, the big public sector industries such as steels and uh, steel, uh, steel manufacturing or mills uh, and coal mines and so on. Um, so it's the second part of it is divestment. We actually have a ministry of disinvestment. And so they go about pulling back from the public sector. That's their job. Um, the third part of it is deregulation, uh, which is actually to open up India to investment and also as a market uh, and as a business proposition for global capital. So deregulate, uh, remove uh, regulations in, in the way of global capital. Um, uh, this is meant uh, changing laws around export and uh, import around investment by capital in India. Um, and of course, this, this came under the, uh, the supervision, the guidance of the World Bank uh, and the IMF. So uh, deregulation, disinvestment, uh, uh, withdrawal from the public sector, uh, eroding labor laws, which would have stood in the way of uh, global capital. So it's a consistent policy of uh, cutting down on previous uh, labor laws. Uh, the Indian government started to create what are called special economic zones. And these are like private enclaves, uh, which 
in which the laws of the, uh, the, the larger labor laws, et cetera, do not operate. Um, so that, that's the framework. Uh, that's, that's what I mean by neoliberalism. Um, and I think the study of childhood is a very important lens into any society. If you wanted to look at, say, the Greeks or the ancient Greeks, or you know, any society, if you want to understand what's going on in that society, and if you try to understand it uh, in terms of what happens to children, how does that society treat its children, it tells you something very particular, very deep about that society. So I use childhood as a lens to, in this case, understand uh, this, uh, this transformation that uh, now is at least 20, 20 years or 19 years uh, old, but it didn't suddenly happen in 1991 uh, since uh, the 1970s, uh, and particularly beginning in 1980, the Indian government had started on these policies. So one of the... Um, one of the new things that happened in India is that it started to be said that India is a young country. Uh, things like the young republic, the new republic, this word, uh, it says the khao yangistan ka vow, show the vow of, uh, you know, how fabulous is Youngistan, you can see it's a combination of the English and Istan, the place of so the place of the young. Suddenly it's this new, hip, cool country. Um, and D, I was born in Ambala in 1961. <laughs> Since you're making this little, uh, it, it, you know, yeah, let's, let's uh, bio. For my generation, we've, uh, you know, and India became independent in 1947. So we're sort of the a generation that came of uh, that grew up in an independent India, but in an India which was uh, which had like uh, socialism as as a term in the the constitution. Uh, we were always told it was an old country. We are what we were proud of was our history, and this was you know we were this ancient country, we were the land of the Buddha, but now it's like this totally new, new youthful uh, country. Um, and these figures are touted about its, its youth. Uh, this is, of course, a, uh, he's the current uh, kind of popular film star. You can see he's advertising Pepsi, and along with it, uh, a game that you can play on television, on Twitter, and you, know, you call in, and so on. So there's a whole culture uh, around youth. And youth is, uh, is the driving force. The idea of youth is a driving force in the new consumer culture. So they say things like 50, and, and this is true, 55% of people in India are under the age of 20. So it is, you know, look at this room here. Right? There's a difference, <laughs> we're like talking about a, a, a different, uh, you know, environment. They said 2015, 550 million people will be, uh, you know, are, will be expected to be, uh, are supposed to be around under the age of 20. Um, uh, children, along with the idea that India uh, is a young country, there's another notion that developed, and that is this idea of a global generation. So the idea that now in India what you have is a new global generation. John, do you want to come sit here? Uh, this is from the inside of a mall. Um, remember this mall because I'm going to come back to the story. It's an important uh, place. But yeah, it's, uh, you go there, you go to these uh, uh, malls. Um, th this is the other face of the, the young, new global generation. The idea is that it's a global generation because it understands and uses and buys uh, global brands and global products. So the, uh, the global generation is actually a marketing term, uh, but which has come into popular use, um, and it's uh, widely used. Disney, very much present. So these global brands are uh, everywhere. 
Uh, this is a Disney performance with you know children. Uh, so even if you don't buy these things, uh, there is uh, you are surrounded by them, and there is the idea that uh, you you are in in a new phase. Um, global brands. Uh, this is anybody that I know. There are people who can recognize her. But yeah, who is this? Aishwarya Rai. That's right. This is Aishwarya Rai, leading uh, Indian film star, um, advertising at L'Oreal, and of course, you know, it's a very cost globalized um, <laughs> citizen. Uh, now that doesn't mean that Indianness has disappeared. If we're having Harry Potter and uh, you know L'Oreal, that doesn't mean that Indianness has disappeared. It is. Also, actually, uh, in consumer culture, you have the, the global, but you also have the, the Indian, although, of course, uh, this is Barbie. Uh, but, but the uh, in, Indian Barbie. So you, no, <laughs> no one could call her Barbie. Uh, yeah. Um, and then there is the hybrid. Uh, so in terms of culture, of course, uh, it's, it's dynamic. You see purity, you see hybridity, you see these international brands. McDonald's, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, ch the chicken burger. Yeah, you'd, you wouldn't want this. OK, thank you. <laughs> and Amu is the nationalized butter, but here it is uh, an Indian butter. But of course, the, the Indian is also, Indian brand is also speaking to the, the global brand. Now, in literature on globalization, a term that has become very popular in media studies is this notion of hybridity. That what we are seeing is uh, an increasing hybridity um, of culture. I, I don't agree with that uh, notion as a way to explain what is going on. Uh, I see it only as a descriptive notion, not an analytical notion. It just describes you what is going on. It doesn't tell you why. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it is not theoretical, uh, in my view. Hybridity is written into capitalism. Capitalism is about inventing new things constantly. And innovation is written into the system. So um, we should expect culture to be hybrid, and you know, especially capitalistic culture to be hybrid. We shouldn't be surprised by it. So I, I don't think it's, it's hybridity that, that can help us explain uh, what is going on. But rather, we have to ask the more historical material questions, such as who owns, who has power in the society? What is the relationship um, in terms of who's, in a, in a very direct, forthright, you know, Marxist way, who owns the means of production? And, I, and what is the relationship between labor and capital? And that's a question uh, that I think can cut through this surface cultural hybridity that we see. Uh, so, oh, I still had some more images. Gosh, I thought I had done that. Uh, but uh, now with this, um, the 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 uh, this globalization of youth culture, there's also a new sexiness which is on display in India. Uh, STD just got local. Uh, <laughs> STD in India actually stands for straight trunk dialing. This, was <laughs> this, is, this is from Nehru's, yeah, straight trunk dialing when you had to call someone like, you know, in a long distance calling. But they're, they're using that phrase from the 50s and the 60s, and they're putting a new twist to it. And, you know, and they're saying, well, STD just called local. You can call anybody. You can have these very, you know, you can lead a very sexy life now. <laughs> you can go, go to, uh, you can be young and hip, and just look at that, what she's doing. <laughs> so, you know, so there's a great like, amount of sexualization 
uh, of uh, images, and that creates, of course, a great deal of moral panic. So on the right, you have this moral panic uh, related to consumer culture. So just as in media studies, I feel we're making a mistake by reading these images as only a, 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 a representation of hybridity. So we're not getting to the root of the problem. And the right sees it as a new sexualization, as this overthrowing of all kinds of authoritarian, you know, patriarchal, caste-based, religious-based uh, hierarchies. And so what they want to do is they want to stop the sexualization, but they want the capitalism. They want the, the private. And so they want capitalism, and they don't want it. And, um, And then they, of course, respond in, in very um, uh, violent, brutal way, uh, ways. We, um, and one of the former, so, uh, foremost uh, ambassadors of this culture of the new hip India is, of course, Bollywood. And the term Bollywood is something coming to uh, talk about uh, Hindi cinema beginnings. Again, sometimes in the 90s, these very spectacular, glossy films uh, whose stories uh, are about wealthy NRI, non-resident Indian families, who, are all, who, all, who have these big weddings and they go from country. They have houses in three continents. And so the, you know, the, that's kind of the Bollywood, uh, this very glossy production. So Bollywood is the, if you could say, the cultural ambassador of this new India. And we got interpolated in it as well, which really tells you that, you know, some profound cultural change is happening, that if you're walking on the roads, you know, on the street, you get hailed uh, into that culture. Uh, this is Nick Nylon, one of the undergraduates here uh, in cinema and photography. And uh, for about a year and a half, I'd been doing this uh, independent project with uh, Danielle, who's here, uh, Nick Nylon, and uh, John Klemke. And we were basically working with um, an institution in Bombay called the Zavis Institute of, uh, Institute of Communications. And we were collaborating on jointly producing some film work. But we had been talking to each other online, and et cetera. So in the spring, uh, in March, 2010, over spring break, Danielle, Nick, and John came to visit me in Bombay and also um, meet uh, these other students uh, and faculty at Xavier's. And on their very first day, they would, while we were in the main part of, uh, or downtown Bombay, a man approached and said, would you like to be in a Bollywood film? Mm -hmm. Yes, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> And they were like, oh, this is just, you know, you talk to her. Well, it turns out Bollywood now has to have a scene with some white people scattered there, right? Because, <laughs> so, because it's, it's all this part about being this cosmopolitan, new, internationalized, uh, you know, image. Uh, cultural, uh, cultural industry based in such, a, such an image. So if you're white and if you're walking around the streets, you just get invited to be uh, in films. And we thought, so, and we learned that because every time we went there, they got an offer. But we took the first, uh, the first offer we did, uh, you know, we were given and we went and we got a chance to be on this set Big, big budget Bollywood film uh, directed by Farah Khan, who's one of the, you know, big, really big, big names in Hindi cinema. The mall that I showed you, uh, the, the image from the mall, this is outside the mall. And for the film set, they had rented the mall for, for the day. They made the outside look like an airport, like the Delhi airport, and the inside was supposed to be Paris. Filmmakers are very in, ingenious, and they know how to get by. It's, it's all about creating an image. So here's Danielle and John and these other poor tourists from wherever they were. <laughs> Israel and you know, Norve Norway and these uh, people from all over the world who got to be in this. And 
Um, John, in fact, got a part. The rest of us were just at the airport pushing carts and so on, but John got to be a policeman who actually arrests this uh, movie star, and, and that's like the Tom Cruise of Hindi cinema. Um, and even I got to play a part. They put, <laughs> they put me on a power suit and put that delicate looking makeup and you know, gave me a, a leather bag. It's a, um, and of course, they're doing many of the, uh, the stereotypes. Uh, you can see the women. <laughs> you know, this, they're supposed to be at the airport. And uh, you know, they're, uh, they're being dressed, dressed up for the part that they were supposed to play, which is the Barbie-fied white girl part. Um, this was the, uh, the dress designer. And of course, it's kind of fun and exciting. So everybody's uh, excited. There's shoes. It's a huge set. And these are the, what in India are called junior artists or extras. These are the people, the Indian, you know, uh, junior artists. And they were the, the smartest and the savviest. They had the most bored looks on the set. And they were like, when, when will they give us breakfast? When will, you know, there be lunch? And, and I was just, you know, follow them. They're kind of the leaders. They'd say, don't, don't go around walking. They find you, you know? The, the director will see you and then make you just stand there. So the idea was actually to, to work as less as possible. Um, and this is the poor designer at the end of, you know, while the shooting was going on. He was taking a nap, exhausted. Um, so where all of these changes are coming from, where these cultural changes are coming from, I think is this transition of the very nature of the Indian state. Um, and that's what we have to look at, is the relationship of the state to, to citizens. Um, and put very briefly, the Indian government has in neoliberalism changed its function from that of being uh, a buffer between, say, capital and, and people, and instead invented itself as a brand. So they actually say that brand India, India Inc., India Shining. So the function of the state now is to market India as a brand. It is not to uh, see that people have education or to build roads or to make sure that you know, there are primary health care centers uh, in the country because that now is being done by private groups. That has been privatized. And instead of, so what is the government doing? The government is then marketing uh, India. Its function is now to, uh, to be a marketing agency. And that's, the brief is to sell India to position it as a good place to do business in and to do business with. And what is it selling? I, I know advertisers and I have, I'm very glad my advertising colleagues are here. Advertisers sell products, but those products are always produced by people. And so actually what advertisers sell is the labor of human beings. Um, and we might believe that what we're selling is an object, but in that object uh, is, is the labor uh, of, uh, of the person or the people who produced it. So the, what India is selling or what, India, what brand India is selling, its core commodity are India's young people. And they're selling them both as consumers. So they're saying that there is this big market now. India is ready to consume as it has never you know, been before. In fact, uh, this new generation, they're called children of liberalization, that they actually don't save and they're not so thrifty and you know, uh, they're a different generation altogether. So the young people are being sold to global capital as consumers, as buyers of these global products. And that's why this celebration of this large number of young people. You know, 55% are going, to, are less than 20. So see what a great market this is. Uh, but actually, 
the 55% the are not all able to consume or are not all buyers. In fact, the large majority are workers. And so that is the other side of um, youth uh, as commodity. So uh, that, that's what India, uh, Brand India is marketing, it is also uh, an English educated uh, and what they say, docile labor force. And that's kind of also how uh, it is represented in uh, the uh, international press. Um, so on, when they talk about Brand India, uh, the, the word Brand India itself comes out of a, a public-private partnership. It was a term that uh, was adopted um, by the Indian government, but it was produced by the Chambers of Commerce. Um, so on the uh, Brand India webpage, for example, they say, the value of Brand India is that you are working, and they mean like you know the, the workers in, in, in India, you are working when America is sleeping, and when America is working, you're still working. <laughs> and <laughs> so there is this, of course, these new commodity, uh, you know, new technologies, communication technologies have totally made it possible to have 24 hour, seven day a work week, you know, so people shut off their computers here and in Hyderabad, people start working where it was left off, say in, in Dallas. Um, and so a core commodity of brand India is a large English educated, technically proficient labor force that promises to reduce labor costs and add value. India as a whole, despite housing the second richest man in the world, and a minority which is part of the transnational bourgeoisie, remains peripheral to the global economy, a source for capitalist accumulation for the global north. It is precisely the center-periphery relationship that enabled the global north following World War II to transition into a consumer economy by shifting production to the third world, a process that was radicalized at the end of the 20th century through credit. So the, you know, your, uh, the, the consuming habits of the, or the possibility for the working middle class to consume here was funded by credit, but it was also subsidized by third world labor. So Walmart, uh, you know, makes it possible for the working middle class people in this country to, to still uh, survive, but that is subsidized, uh, you know, both, both through credit and uh, third world labor. And why we shouldn't take this theory of hybridity too seriously is because it is only about consuming behavior of people. It tries to understand society only through what people eat and what they drink and what they wear. Um, because, and why that is wrong, why that's not a good enough explanation, is because consuming in capitalistic societies is based on your purchasing power. It is based on your ability to buy. Um, so, it, it, it remains always a form of class distinction, uh, as uh, Pierre Bourdieu talks about, you know, con uh, consuming as, as a form of cultural capital um, it's, uh, and consumption. So this kind of cosmopolitanism that we are seeing that is celebrated in this narrative of global India um, is a class-based cosmopolitanism. It's a capitalist uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, and it paradoxically allows the upper class Indian to be both nationalist and global. Uh, and that is because to be nationalist now, as you, you know, here we've been used to it for a long time, but in India this is new. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the idea that you are uh, patriotic through consumption is new in India, but it's, it's been adopted. So, um, so the function of the citizen is to consume, and citizenship is an act of consumption. And so it has, it has paradoxically made it possible for a class to totally secede from India, uh, to say we are being Indian by, by consuming, which as I said, consuming is based in, in capitalism. So um, 
And, and this represents a cultural shift. Um, so uh, there was this interview that I'd like to read to you, which was reported in, uh, in, you know, in the society pages uh, of a gossip magazine. Um, so Sheetal Mafatlal, she is, Mafatlals are like the Rockefellers or, you know, Murdochs uh, in India. Uh, one of the mem uh, the, the daughter-in-law of that family, Sheetal Mafatlal, uh, uh, she was asked this question about, you know, and she is herself a designer and she's brought international brands such as Valentino in the Indian market. So the interviewer asks her, uh, do you think mindsets have to be addressed? Do you think people feel guilty about seeming to be spending on luxury goods in a country like India? So she says, I think India is changing. It reflects it in the food we eat, the way people dress, in the restaurant boom, in the media. Do you feel that you represent the new Indian spender? You have to do what you have to do without making any apologies for it. That's her reply. That's the, that's the core ideology of neoliberalism. You have to do what you have to do. You live for yourself, ultimately. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very deeply embedded idea of uh, individualism. I do what I do. I don't need to explain or offer any apology. Uh, but this refusal to apologize is also a disavowal of shared citizenship. It is, it is a flight response, it's a, it's a, it's a secession. There is, there is a tendency in, uh, in capitalism to lower wa workers' wages. Any, any good business school undergraduate will tell you that. that uh, the way you, uh, you increase profits or you raise the, the bottom line is by lowering wages, um, depressing wages. And we, uh, so I think you have to think about uh, young people in India as part of this uh, global uh, labor force. Uh, and it's the youngest nation with <laughs> fortunate future demographics, <laughs> uh, you know, which was the, this big problem of India. Its high population is, is now uh, its, its asset, uh, which is what it, it should have always been. But uh, okay. So I'll, I'll just read out a little bit uh, here um, for you that for. So for all the celebration of the dawning of this new age of the Indian consumer, the typical Indian consumer is already consuming far less than their needs. And India has the dubious distinction of having the largest number of child labor in the world, with 60 million working in conditions akin to slavery, by an ILO estimate. Um, for brand India, though, this is a PR problem. This is a problem of marketing. It's not a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, it's a problem that tarnishes the image and the competitiveness of India in the global market. Uh, last year, a story had broken out about a sweatshop in New Delhi, which was producing uh, Christmas uh, clothing for Gap. And when that news broke out, Kamal Nath, who uh, was the, uh, the Minister for Commerce, uh, uh, you know, who I, I have cited here, he, he chastised uh, the social activists for bringing uh, bad publicity uh, to India, which he said would actually enable the rich countries to set up non-tariff barriers so they would stop buying from India and, of course, take their business elsewhere. So he does understand you know, how global capitalism functions. Uh, capital is very mobile. As soon as workers in one country start to claim rights and raise their wages, they can just shift their production elsewhere. But what is important is that these very same arguments about child labor, about the value of child labor for national economic development were raised a century ago, and they were raised in Britain, where the capitalists actually argued to keep child labor. And they said children's hands are particularly nimble and useful, and they are good for the glory of Britain. 
So, uh, you know, you, the history, in that sense, we, we should not forget history uh, that what we are in the midst of now is, is not anything new. That's why it is called neoliberal, neoliberalism. It's the return of these uh, principles of free market. And it is bringing in then the, the culture uh, as well. And it's a very ruthless culture. It, it really, the, at the heart of it, believes that no group, no individual, no society, no place deserves any protection that each and every one should be able to look after themselves, so why not uh, children? For the middle class that is squeezed between these polarities, so what we're seeing is a disappearing, a thinning uh, middle class. What that has done uh, is that it has placed an even greater importance on children's education as a way, as a safeguard against this very volatile economy. It is very important for us to remember that in, at the heart of the institution of childhood is a very beautiful idea, and it is that if you give human beings the best opportunities, the resources, you can actually produce a wonderful, a, a wonderful society that at, at the end of the day, we're all the same. <laughs> we all want the best for our children. So it's a very universalist idea, and that um, you can break these old uh, inequalities. The childhood or children represent a possibility. They repre each child represents a new possibility. Um, so because of that, because this uh, is against these feudal ideas or feudal notions that if you're born a cobbler, you're going to be a cobbler, and then you know, it, it's, it questions these high caste hierarchies. So the middle class, which has the potential to, to go up or go down, is very vested in educating children. And because all that they can pass to their children is cultural capital, you know, we, uh, if, if my daughter decided to drop out of school, she, she will fall into the, you know, she will fall into the uh, arms of the, the homeless. Um, so there is an increasing pressure on children uh, a much heightened pr pressure on children in the middle class uh, to compete. Um, and of course, uh, parents, especially mothers, are very involved in that process and that creates all kinds of uh, you know, turmoil in, in uh, familial relationships, which is something that I, I do look at um, elsewhere. This kind of um, deadly race uh, that children are being pushed into actually uh, created these hoaxes, uh, which hit the near, which uh, hit national attention in the last few years. So, for example, and I'll read some of these to you. And you know, this is not science fiction. It's it's just how absurd life is. Um, Aditya Patil was a Microsoft certified systems engineer by the age of 11 and offered a, joy, uh, offered a job by the Bill Gates Corporation. Sushma Varma, a seven year old, successfully completed the 10th grade, beating another child, Avatar Tulsi, who had done this feat earlier at the age of nine. I mean, so these kind of these success stories were, were fed and we're hearing this is, uh, you know, a, a very terrible version of the capitalist dream. Um, then, of course, some of these end up being hoaxes and are caught, such as a 15-year-old who claimed that he had topped a NASA exam, and the president of the country actually hosted him and had dinner with him, and then it all turned out to be a, a big sham. But, you know, it's this culture of self-promotion, marketing, hustling. It's it's taking the ch time away from play, from uh, to just growth. So, I think uh, from, from Marxist uh, or feminist theory, Marxist feminist theory, we know this much that capitalism is a global system. So again, this is not something that, that is new. It is actually inherent to capital to keep expanding, 
to bring in newer and newer areas, both as new markets and as uh, sources, uh, cheap source of labor and, and other you know, raw material, et cetera. But its global nature is driven not by the demands or needs of human beings, but by the drive to generate new capital. So Barbie doesn't come to India because Indian girls want to play with Barbie. Barbie comes to India because Mattel wants to find a, a new market. And so that's why I'm saying, like, let's, you know, let's look beyond the cultural hybridity and let's look beyond the culture to look at the foundations, the material foundations of uh, this culture. The celebratory uh, discourse around youth consumer culture in India today would have us believe that this is India's first global generation. Yet this is not so. There is still alive a generation, now grandmothers and grandfathers, who were born in colonial India or came of age in that first wave of exploitation by global capital. In order to sell India once again, its leaders have to empty the nation of its people, its citizens, and their troublesome historical memories. Uh, such as this following uh, critique, and this is uh, a former teacher, a mentor, uh, a man by the name of uh, Randhir Singh. So he says, before 1947, we were part of a global system, well integrated into a world market economy. We were globalized, so to speak, but we did not like it. <laughs> Our globalization then also had a name imperialism, and we struggled against it. Precisely because its structural logic meant the accumulation of wealth in England and poverty in India. Like other third world countries, we wanted to get out of this globalization, to be able to opt for an independent, self-reliant development in the interests of our common people. Now India is being globalized again, this time largely through a voluntary submission of Indian's rulers who are opting out to be junior partners to the global capitalist system. The national project finally and definitively collapsed in 1991. So the framework I'm uh, using for, uh, for, for this book is the notion of underdevelopment, uh, which was you know, uh, developed in Latin America to understand dependency, to understand these uh, economies as uh, colonial uh, economies. And that is, again, at the heart of the transformation to, to neoliberalism in 1970s, uh, which you know, was very violently brought about in Chile in 1973, when Allende was removed and uh, Pinochet was uh, put there to, to completely privatize, um, to privatize the, the economy. So um, Latin America provides us a great lesson uh, in, in understanding what uh, the nature of neoliberalism is. Uh, um, in, and it tells us something also about its anti-democratic um, impulse. And the anti-democratic impulse comes from the, the sort of systemic logic of capitalism, which is towards generating profit. It is short term. It doesn't think in terms of the long term. Um, because it puts the long-term costs into the future. It is this after me, the flood, you know, let future generations pay for uh, whatever sort of, um, uh, you know, these short-term uh, uh, short considerations that, uh, that we do. Um, Brand India is a merger of state and capital, and it is now openly arming and fortifying itself. Uh, some of you may know that uh, large parts of uh, central and eastern India are now out, out of the Indian government control. Uh, you, if you can't go travel to those places. There are barricades, and there's an armed conflict um, happening. Um, so India, uh, and I, uh, while I was in India, of course, I read the business papers, uh, the Indian business papers, as I uh, do here. And this was a, a, a headline uh, in, in the Financial Times. And it's unabashed. It says, India Inc. waits with its finger on the trigger. And it's basically the, the whole report was on the 
uh, increased investment corporations are making in private security in surveillance. So, and the, the job for young people, especially young men, that is uh, increasing and increasing exponentially while other jobs ha have a peak and uh, fall depending on the global market is in private security. Uh, and there are private militias um, uh, as well. And so you, you get these jobs too. And so basically the state is arming a class which could point the gun back at itself. It's a very violent, uh, in, it's produced a very violent, insecure, and uh, dangerous uh, uh, situation. Um, because it had, the state has pulled out of uh, intervening in social infrastructure in actually producing a society uh, which, which could depend on a certain degree of stability in terms of health or education or uh, its children's future. Uh, it ha in that vacuum are now these private militias as well as uh, private corporations. I see the, the f what will be the future uh, of this depends a great deal on where the middle class falls. Uh, in this armed conflict that I said is going on in India right now, the middle class has still tended to stay back. Um, but I think this basic idea that if you study very hard, you will make it is proving to be not true already to, to, the, to the younger generation. Um, so people are already feeling a great amount of despair um, that you, you might work very hard and still not make it. And I think that might be the, uh, the edge, the turning point. Uh, whether the, you know, so where the middle class will fall will depend on whether uh, the Indian government is able to provide at least somewhat uh, of a, a social structure uh, for, for the children. But that doesn't seem to be so far uh, the, the case. And uh, I think the other thing that we learn from, from Marx uh, is that capitalism keeps sowing the seeds of its own destruction wherever <laughs> it keeps producing these oppositions. So, you know, as I said, India radically uh, integrated into global capital is also much more disintegrated as a country and its, you know, social fabric um, is, is getting disintegrated. And you can see, uh, you know, you can understand that uh, in relationship to here as well. So we're actually seeing an even younger and younger uh, generation getting radicalized. Uh, so if they are being you know, turned into consumers and workers at a young age, so are they uh, turning into political activists? And that is, I think, where uh, the presence of these grandfathers and grandmothers is very important, people who remember and who support that struggle. So we don't, so I, I think, again, within uh, Marxist feminist theory, we should not accept the Oedipal story as the, uh, as the story of the way in which change has happened, because the Oedipal narrative, uh, and, and it has some basis in, uh, in truth um, in certain bourgeois experiences, but the Oedipal narrative is that the young want to kill, kill the old. And change happens when the young, you know, when sons kill, kill fathers. Uh, but that really denies working class experience, working class history, where actually the, the fathers and the grandfathers and the grandmothers and the grandfathers are actually teachers and mentors. And they, they give that kind of support. So, um, and this. You know, so those contradictions of capitalism are everywhere. Uh, Pakistan, March 20th, 2003, uh, so right after the attack on Iraq, McDonald's has to be protected. You know, it becomes, it becomes a target. Um, so um, so the, the contradictions, the seeds of, you know, its, its own destruction are, are very, very much there. Um, and. And I hope to be able to describe some of that. Uh, uh, some of my work is closed textual analysis of uh, films and uh, cultural commodities and toys. 
But um, in this book, I'm finding I have to uh, do actually a lot of like ethnographic detailing and, and description. So that was it. Uh, thank you.